Hello, everybody, and welcome to the tip of the iceberg live. The first time we're doing this for hopefully on a weekly basis, coming to you in lieu of game recaps on a night to night basis. We're going to come with a Tuesday live where we recap the week that was for the Pittsburgh Penguins, preview the week that's upcoming, throw in a three stars, talk about some of the biggest headlines, and answer some of your questions surrounding the Pittsburgh Penguins. Reminder, this is your home for Pittsburgh Penguins news and analysis. You can find us on YouTube right here at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcasts from. We already got some questions. We already got some commenters. We already got some viewers. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. And I'm excited to kick off this new edition of the tip of the iceberg with everybody watching at home. But let's get into the week in review for the Penguins because it's been a very, very good week. You obviously saw the title of this episode. The Penguins are surging as they enter the final month of the NHL regular season. Penguins 3-0-2 in their last five games, dating back to that Sunday afternoon game against the Colorado Avalanche, a 5-4 Loss in overtime there. They also followed that up with a pair of wins in the middle of the week last week. Four to one victory over the Carolina Hurricanes in what was a very emotional night. Jake Gensel returns for Carolina for the first time in an opposing uniform. Sam Poulin makes his 2024, I almost said NHL debut, but he made his 2024 debut at the NHL level after a great start to the season and a great season in general with the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Penguins able to get the 4-1 to victory over the Carolina Hurricanes there. They followed that up with a 3-2 to victory over the Columbus Blue Jackets on home ice before losing the second half of that back-to-back in a 4-3 to shootout loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets. And then last night, a 5-2 to win over the New York Rangers at Madison Square Garden that ends their nine-game road winless streak. This team is very hard to predict, very hard to project at this point in the season, especially because you look at how down and out they appeared to be around the NHL trade deadline, how down and out they appeared to be following the NHL trade deadline. And then they come out and they have a week like this, 3-0-2. They could have been 5-0 and if not for two blown leads in the third period, a 4-2 to lead over the Colorado Avalanche going into the third period of that one, and a 3 to nothing lead over the Columbus Blue, or sorry, 3-1 to lead, I should say, over the Columbus Blue Jackets on Saturday night. So that's going to be a big issue that the Penguins need to address this offseason. It's not something that they can get out of their nature right now because it's something that has been plaguing them, not just this season, but it was plaguing them last season as well. Part of that might be the coaching, and that might be a change that we see this offseason from Kyle Dubas. What kind of coaching changes, what kind of front office changes could we expect from Kyle Dubas heading into his first full offseason as president and general manager of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Mike Sullivan seems like his job is secure unless he desires to go elsewhere, but Todd Reardon could be on the chopping block. A guy like Mike Volucci could be on the chopping block as well. But those blown leads, I think it's interesting because a lot of people point directly to coaching. That also has to go to the leadership group there as well. So I'm not exactly sure what the issue is. Obviously, the issue is they can't hold a lead, and they obviously always take their foot off the gas, which I just I don't understand why you would do that if you're the Penguins. You heard last night on the broadcast in a similar fashion, Penguins trying to hold on to a third period lead. Mike Rupp saying, you might not want to get that third goal as much as you just want to protect the lead. I think that kind of mindset is part of the problem for the Penguins. They're trying to protect the lead. They're just trying to keep the two goal lead and not trying to extend that lead. And I understand you don't want to get out over your skates. You don't want to cause multiple two-on-one shorthanded or not shorthanded but odd man rush opportunities but at the same time you want to stay aggressive because in the case that it does happen and it happens to the penguins a lot they blow that lead you want to be able to at least have some momentum going because in a lot of these games you see it time and time again they have the lead going into the third period they blow the lead and by the time it's tied yeah it's 50 50 split at that point you should have just as much of a chance as the other team to go out there and win the game when it's tied like that but they just don't have any momentum at that point. And that's the biggest issue for them when they blow those third period leads is they have no momentum and they're at this stage of the game, not able to get their feet going once again to kick back into high gear and get the victory. More often than not, when they blow that third period lead, they end up losing the game. They don't get the two points in some off on some cases, I should say they don't even come away with one standings point. So on two occasions, Penguins, 
They end up losing in overtime in 3-0-2. Could have been 5-0-0, and we're going to talk about the standings here in a minute. Two extra standings points has them in a very interesting spot. Not that they're not in an interesting spot now, but if they were within three points going into tonight's game instead of being within five points, things get a lot more interesting, especially with the date with the Washington Capitals on the horizon for Thursday evening. But I also mentioned Sam Poulin. I want to talk about him for just a minute here. Poulin has had a very interesting path to getting back to the NHL this year. Obviously, last season he makes his NHL debut three games early in the season. Not much going on, similar to what we've seen from him at the NHL level this season. I think we've seen a little bit of a better performance, but last year it was similar. Not a whole lot to write home about. Playing good hockey, but not playing meaningful hockey. Not playing hockey that really pushes the Penguins towards winning. Just doesn't push them towards losing either. And then he obviously takes that long extended mental health break that he's been very open about. He returns to hockey. He's happy with hockey again. And he has a ph phenomenal season at Wilkes-Barre Scranton. Does suffer a couple injuries, one early in the season, which was a high ankle sprain, which takes him out of the running for getting some of those early call-ups. So the Penguins go to veterans like Vinny Henestrosa, Redeem Zahorna gets a couple of chances, Colin White gets caught up instead. And then later in the season, there's another opportunity, but he's injured once again. Nola Chari goes down the first time. Sam Poulain's injured at the same time. He's not able to take advantage. And then finally, the stars align for Sam Poulain. Unfortunate for Nola Chari, his season at this point seemingly over. Sam Poulain finally gets the opportunity, gets called up in a big game where the Penguins need to get the win over a very good Carolina Hurricanes team. I thought he had a great performance in that one. That was when he was on a line with Yessa Yarvi and Jonathan Gruden, and that was their game to get to, to really take over. Yarvi had a great game. Jonathan Gruden got into a fight, laid a couple of big hits, and also Sam Poulin just steadying everything down in the middle of it. I thought he had a really stellar performance against the Carolina Hurricanes. A decent performance against the Columbus Blue Jackets as well. Not as much when it comes to making those offensive plays, but playing stout, playing physical, playing great on the four check. I thought he had a good game against Columbus in the first game. Second game, again, just not building off of one another. So you see why he gets sit, sat down in the healthy scratch for Emil Bemstrom, who had been out of the lineup for a long time before that. But so far, I thought he's been pretty good. Three games played this season, matched the three games he played last season. I'm intrigued to see if he gets another shot in the lineup, especially coming off of a big win against New York where he was the healthy scratch. You would have to imagine tonight against the Devils that the Penguins end up going with the similar lineup, obviously excluding the, excluding the guys potentially that were out of the lineup due to sickness, whether that's Tristan Jari, if he's able to get back into the lineup, whether that's John Ludwig, if he's able to get back into the lineup. But I would assume at some point the remainder of the season, you're going to see Sam Poulin get another stretch of games, and I'm excited to see what he's able to do with that. Let's move over and talk about our three stars of the week, not of the game anymore. Third star, I'm going to give it to Alex Nedeljkovic. In five games played, Alex Nedeljkovic has that 3-0-2 record, a 921 save percentage, and a 2.40 goals against average. It has been his net for the last week and a half, and it's a very different feel than what you would expect from the Penguins with the backs against the wall, needing to get these victories, needing to stack victories on top of victories on top of victories. They turn to Alex Nedeljkovic. He has been steady as she goes in the net for the past week and a half, and it's kind of like an Alex Lyon situation. If you remember, last year the Florida Panthers were among the teams that were fighting with the Penguins and the New York Islanders to get into that final playoff spot. And it wasn't Sergei Bobrovsky. It wasn't Spencer Knight. It was Alex Lyon that was backstopping them into the Stanley Cup playoffs. And then while he kicked it off, Sergei Bobrovsky took it off and took him to the Stanley Cup final. So if this is a similar situation, maybe Alex Nedeljkovic is the guy to get the Penguins the best chance to get back into the playoffs. There's eight games remaining. You would have to imagine with him playing last night in New York, if Tristan Jari is able to go tonight, Tristan Jari is likely to play tonight. and then. With the remaining seven games, as of right now, you would have to imagine Alex Nedeljkovic gets the first look in a lot of those performances. Interesting for the offseason, depending on how these last couple of weeks shake out with Alex Nedeljkovic, but he has been stellar over the past couple of weeks or past couple of games, especially last night against the New York Rangers. He was on top of his game, making a lot of saves, even that first goal for 
Capo Caco was a brilliant save that just barely got into the net. He just couldn't handle his glove side, and he just unfortunately pulled the puck into the net, but a great save nonetheless from Alex Nedeljkovic. He is the third star of the week. Second star of the week, going to go to Brian Rust. We talked about him on the tip of the iceberg earlier today. He is absolutely lighting the world on fire since Jake Gensel left the lineup on February 15th. Obviously, Gensel went on to be traded, but Brian Rust has been an absolute stud for the Penguins over the last couple of weeks. This week in particular, five games played, five goals, and two assists. If you watched last night's game, you know Brian Rust could have scored probably three or four goals, not just the two that he notched against Igor Shosturkin. He had an opportunity. Sorry, he notched one against Igor Shosturkin. The other one was an empty net goal. He had a couple of other opportunities right in front of the net, just wasn't able to put them home. But he is on absolute fire right now. He is one of the most dangerous players in the game when he is on a heater like this. And he's starting to remind you a little bit about Jake Gensel with how much he's putting the puck in the back of the net. One goal away from a career high, which is 27, or tying a career high, which is 27, and four goals away from his first 30-goal season would certainly be nice if he's able to capture that. Third star of the week, we're going to go, well, with who else we would go with. It's Sidney Patrick Crosby. Five games played, four goals, nine assists in these last couple of games including that four-point performance against the Colorado Avalanche, a three-point performance against the Carolina Hurricane, and as we saw yesterday, a three-point performance against the New York Rangers. Sidney Crosby, on top of all that, becomes tied for first with Wayne Gretzky for the most point-per-game seasons in NHL history. That is a huge statistic. That is a huge, huge accomplishment for Sidney Crosby. I talked about it earlier today and I said that might be the single biggest individual accomplishment that Sidney Crosby has accomplished to this point in his career obviously if he finishes in the top five in scoring that's going to surpass it if he finishes you know past Gordie Howe for fourth if he finishes past Mark Messier for third if he finishes past Yarmir Yager for second which you know maybe that's a pipe dream because of how far away Yarmir Yager is. I talked about it earlier today. If he hadn't have been injured, Sidney Crosby, that is, he probably would have already been there. But again, when you look at the Penguins, the last couple of games, when you look at the Penguins 3-0 and 2 record, Sidney Crosby has his name plastered all over it. But do we expect anything different from the Penguins captain? He has been lights out all season long. He had that little dip around the trade deadline. But if you look at what he's been able to do over the past week, what he's been able to do really over the past month, he has been an absolute stud for the Penguins. And he has been as advertised as one of the best players in the game still at the age of 36. Let's take a look at what's up next for the Penguins. And then I'll answer any questions you have. It looks like we already have three in the comment section. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll answer all your questions here before we go today on Tip of the Iceberg Live. But up next for the Penguins, over the next week, they have four games, a lot of every other day scenarios here in April for the Penguins, starting tonight with the second half of a back-to-back against the New Jersey Devils. That's going to be a tough matchup for the Penguins. They've lost the last seven games played straight up against the New Jersey Devils, including a 5-2 to two loss just a couple of weeks ago. It seems like the Penguins just don't have the answers for the New Jersey Devils' speed. We'll see if they are able to figure it out here in their last matchup of the season, and they're going to need to because the Devils are right there with the Penguins. They're right behind the Penguins. In fact, the Penguins only jumped the New Jersey Devils yesterday with their victory over the New York Rangers, so a massive matchup tonight at the Prudential Center. Penguins looking to stay ahead of the New Jersey Devils and looking to close that gap between them and those final couple of wild card teams, the Philadelphia Flyers in Metro Third, the Washington Capitals in the second wild card spot, the Detroit Red Wings, who are in the first spot out of the playoffs right now, but tied in points. We'll get to the standings here in a minute. But tonight is a massive night around the NHL, and the Penguins and the Devils are one of the most marquee matchups that you can watch. Speaking of marquee matchups, 100% coming up on Thursday is going to be a massive one. The table can be set. The stage can be set a little bit later tonight if the Penguins take care of business against the Devils and if the Capitals struggle against the Buffalo Sabres. But Pens, Caps, has it ever been a big game before between these two? 
a 100%. It's going to be another one on Thursday in the nation's capital. Penguins closing out this four-game road trip, all four games against Metropolitan Division rivals against the Washington Capitals, a team right now that is sitting in the spot that the Penguins won. The Capitals are in a playoff spot. They've been playing, I don't want to say well, they've been playing well, but they've just been playing better than the rest where there is not a lot that you can really say about the Eastern Conference right now. It's kind of a crapshoot, but the Capitals are the best of the crapshoot right now, and that's where the Penguins are gunning for, and that's going to be a huge matchup coming up on Thursday. And then it doesn't get easier for the Penguins. Honestly, it doesn't get easier for any of the remaining eight games. Go check out their schedule right now. It is a gauntlet to finish the season for the Pittsburgh Penguins. On Saturday, it doesn't get any easier. Like I mentioned, they return home to take on the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now, the Lightning, I watched them against the Buffalo or Boston Bruins earlier last week, I should say. Man, do they look like they're ready for playoff hockey. They've been kind of teetering around the wild card, struggling to stay in that top three in the Atlantic division, but they look like they're ready for playoff hockey. They're without Mikhail Sergachev, who suffered another major injury a couple weeks ago, but those trade deadline acquisitions, Matt Dumba, somebody that I said the Penguins should look for when they were actually buyers. Anthony Duclair, somebody that I've said all season long that they should be looking for in the Penguins before they were not no longer buyers. Both of them fitting seamlessly for the Tampa Bay Lightning. That is going to be a hectic matchup. The Lightning like to play an up-tempo style. It's similar to what you saw from the New York Rangers last night, except the Tampa Bay Lightning are much better and much more potent at five on five. That's going to be the biggest determining factor is can the Penguins stay out of the box, though? Because the Tampa Bay Lightning on the power play, they've torched the Penguins when they've played them this season. So we'll see what's able to happen there. But if you remember, it's not like the Penguins are without success against the Tampa Bay Lightning this year. Tristan Jari's one and only goal in the National Hockey League coming against the Tampa Bay Lightning down at Amelie Arena. So we'll see if the venue change favors the Penguins in this one. It's been a while since they've played. The Lightning are a much better team. The Penguins... We'll have to see. There's two games between now and then, but if they beat the Devils tonight and they beat the Capitals on Thursday, I'll say they are a better team now than they were back then because beating the Rangers, the Capitals, and the Devils, and they're on top of that, the fact that they beat the Carolina Hurricanes last week, that tells you that this is a Penguins team that is playing at their best. So I'm interested to see how the Penguins enter that game against the Tampa Bay Lightning because they lose these next two it might be a moot point. It might be time to, to pack things up. I know a lot of people in the comment section are already saying the Penguins should pack things up. They should get their tea times all set. But again, you win the next two games, things get very, very interesting. And then to round out this next week before our next live stream, which will be next Tuesday, the Penguins will have a Monday night matchup against the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Kyle Dubas Bowl, the last time these two teams faced off, it didn't go well for the Penguins. A seven to nothing defeat Back in December at the hands of the Toronto Maple Leafs, will the Penguins be able to get revenge and take the season series against the Buds? That's going to be the storyline going into Monday. And I also know that you have a lot of questions in the comments. So we're going to get to those in just a second. But before we do that, let's take a look at the standings. Because like I mentioned, out of nowhere, and this is the second time the Penguins have surprised me whenever I've looked at the standings and somebody has told me, hey, you know, they're only five points out again. This time, it doesn't feel like they backed their way into it like they did last time, but this time, the games right after this could severely jump them from five points to potentially three by the end of tonight to potentially one point behind the Washington Capitals by the time we wake up on Friday morning and get ready for this weekend. Let's take a look at those standings right now. In the Metropolitan third space, because that is far from being determined, the Philadelphia Flyers have 83 points in 76 games played, so the Penguins... They don't just have one spot that they could gun for. They have two. That Philadelphia Flyer spot is 100% up for grabs. Flyers are not playing their best hockey at all, not to mention the fact that John Tortorella went on a Michelle Terrian-esque rant yesterday about the Philadelphia Flyers' performance in their overtime loss to the New York Islanders. This team is turning to a, albeit very high-profile prospect, but turning to a prospect in net and Ivan Fedotov, this is a team that has not been playing their best hockey, and the Penguins have two games in hand on them. So six points back of the Flyers with two games in hand. You take care of business there, not to mention you have a head-to-head -head matchup with them still on the calendar. You could easily 
catch the Philadelphia Flyers if things go in the right direction and they take care of business. I mentioned the Tampa Bay Lightning have kind of ran away with that first wild card spot. They're still balancing around the Toronto Maple Leafs. They have 89 points in 74 games played. We're just going to tell you right now, that's not going to happen. They're not going to catch the Tampa Bay Lightning. Even if they get that four point swing coming up here over the weekend, I don't think that's that that's in the question. I think that's pretty pretty safe to say that it's not going to be in the question as I'm scrolling through these all also. But you look down at what's remaining. The Washington Capitals, 82 points in 73 games played. The Detroit Red Wings, 82 points in 75 games played. You look at the New York Islanders, 79 points in 74. And then there's the Pittsburgh Penguins at 77. Five points between them and the Capitals, six points between them and the Flyers. Two potential playoff spots up for grabs. Yes, it's an outside chance. According to Money Puck, it's about an 8% chance. Which, listen, if we bump that up to 8.7, all I'm saying is it's fate. That's all I'm saying. But right now, the Penguins can do some serious damage if they take care of the New Jersey Devils tonight. If the Washington Capitals have some trouble with the Buffalo Sabres tonight. And if the Penguins can take care of business against the Washington Capitals on Thursday in the nation's capital. So that's the standings check-in as of right now. We might not do a standings check-in every single time, but it's the playoffs. So you got to check right now. We're, we're in the quest for the Stanley Cup, the push for the playoffs. I'm very, very excited to see what the Penguins are able to do and how they're able to respond over the next couple of games here. We have plenty of questions, so we're going to get to those right now. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm going to make sure I try to get to as many of these questions as humanly possible here before saying goodbye. I, I'm trying to kind of get used to the flow of these things, these live streams, which hopefully we can con remain consistent with every single Tuesday around this same time. Ryan was the first in with the question, so Ryan is the first question I'm going to answer. Do you think the Penguins can still make the playoffs? Yes, I think they still can make the playoffs. Now, this week is obviously major. You have matchups against teams that are right around you in the standings. Capitals are in a position, like I've mentioned, that you want to be in if you're the Penguins. So you get to get that four-point swing opportunity on Thursday. But even tonight's game, a game against a team, like I mentioned earlier, that they haven't beaten since, what, 2021? They've lost their last seven matchup against the New Jersey Devils. A win tonight does a lot for the Penguins momentum-wise, and a win tonight does a lot for them in the standings-wise. So I think while, yes, the odds are slim, I think there's still a chance they make the playoffs. Football GOAT, CR7, Cristiano Ronaldo fan. I don't know. I'm kind of more a messy guy myself, but we'll leave that for another podcast and another discussion or another day. Do you think the Penguins will make the playoffs, asks Football GOAT. That is a tough call right now. If I had to put my money on it, and that is when you know I am telling you the absolute truth because I take my money very seriously. But if I had to put my money on it, and I am a betting man, a lot of you might not like this. A lot of you might be expecting this. I wouldn't put my money on the Penguins to make the playoffs. They've been great over the past week. A couple really stellar performances. Carolina and New York headline those two performances. But that doesn't erase the previous 68 games played where I saw a Penguins team that wasn't able to get three game winning streaks really at all. They've had three winning streaks of three games or more. Two of them stopped dead at three. And the other one was a five gamer that they had in November. So if I had to put my money on it, hate to be a Debbie downer here, but if I had to put my money on it, I would say no. We have a couple more questions here. Let me go to captain Kirk game says, is Jay possibly possibly on the way out next year, 2025 season? I think you're talking about Tristan Jari. I think that's around the time that this came in is when I was talking about Nadelkovich versus Jari. The door is more open now to me than it has been ever before. Now, again, to me before, it was not open at all. It was closed. The lock was in. Five-year contract. No move clause or partial no trade clause. That tells you a little something about what the Penguins thought about Tristan Jari coming into this season. But as I talked about this morning, if Alex Nadelkovich carries this team into the playoffs, starting six of these last eight games, seven of these last eight games, what have you, depending on back-to-backs, we'll see. But if, if Alex Nadelkovich does that, and considering the fact that Trista Jari has a sub-900 save percentage since January 1st, once again, another issue that has 
cropped up once again for Tristan Jari. If that is the case, I think the door is open for them to explore different options. I, I close out tonight today's tip of the iceberg with a chaos theory. I'll throw it out here, and, and hopefully it doesn't blow up this entire stream. I mean, it'd be great if it blew it up numbers-wise, but hopefully it doesn't shut down. If the Penguins want salary cap space and can move on from Tristan Jari, Blomqvist has looked really good, and Marc-Andre Fleury is an unrestricted free agent. Just saying, just saying, that's chaos theory. Do I think that it's possible that he's on his way out next year? I think there is a possibility, although I would say the chances of that happening are slim to none. The Erickson family says, hey, Nick, thanks for the hard work. Appreciate it. It's not hard work when you enjoy what you're doing. That's what I'm doing right here, although it is it is hard work. But I do enjoy what I'm doing. The question, do you think Dubis and Sullivan are on the same page on things moving forward? 100%. You want to look at a GM and a head coach that aren't on the same page. Look back to last season, Ron Hextall, Mike Sullivan. They barely talked. They weren't on the same page. If you looked at anything that was written by Rob Rossi or Josh Yoey of the athletic after last season, you know, they were not on the same page last season. I do believe that Dubas and Mike Sullivan are on the same page this season though. I think there was a concerted plan sculpted by both Kyle Dubas and Mike Sullivan to try to get this team of veterans this year. You can believe what you want about whether that was the right move. It turns out doesn't appear to be because now they got young legs and now they're playing some better hockey. But you know that they have to look at this and Kyle Dubas saying he wants to make this team younger. You have to think that Mike Sullivan is on the same page there. I would think from an outsider's perspective that these two are on the same page. So thank you for the question, Erickson family. Appreciate you tuning in. Pittsburgh Hornets. Pittsburgh Hornets is in every live stream that I'm in. He's on the All Steelers Talk live streams. He's on this live stream. So I appreciate Pittsburgh Hornets for jumping in. He asked a question here. I know that there is no path that is easy, but what is the past path of least, least resistance, if I can talk, to the playoffs or most likely? Well, I don't know if I could describe any path for the Penguins at this point as the path of least resistance simply because, well, the Penguins have put themselves in that position. I mean, you need to win six of these last eight games seven of these last eight games just to give yourself an opportunity. But the path of least resistance is win all of those games and force all of these other teams that have been just as volatile as the Penguins to win out as well. The Philadelphia Flyers are falling off a cliff. The Washington Capitals are just kind of barely hanging on there. They're playing better, but they also are a young team that are prone to those mistakes. And you have that matchup coming up on Thursday. That is huge for the Penguins. The Islanders are are a very, very volatile team, as is their head coach, Patrick Waugh. The Red Wings are coming off of an absolutely horrendous stretch. They've gotten a little bit better. They've kicked it back into high gear, but who's to say they won't bounce back into that horrendous stretch? There's no clear path for the Penguins unless they win, though. That's the biggest thing. They need to take care of business. If the rest doesn't fall in their favor, that's their own fault, and they're the only people that they can blame for that is themselves. But I think the path of least resistance is probably... Just, I mean, you have to win your games. And at the end of the day, it's two Metropolitan Division teams that are holding you out right now, the Flyers and the Washington Capitals. But you also have games against both of those teams. The last game of the season is against the New York Islanders. You have another game against the Detroit Red Wings, who you've played well against this year. So the path of least resistance, just win. I know it's a, it's a difficult schedule. It is a gauntlet in front of the Penguins. But that's the only path that they have is forward and through these teams that are right above them or right around them in the st standings sitting right in front of them on the schedule. Grant asks, let's pretend we make it to the playoffs. Thinking Ned or Jari would start? Well, I think that depends on how you get there. If it is, like I mentioned earlier, Alex Nedeljkovic backstopping you into a playoff spot, there's not a chance in hell that you take that net away from him. You can't. You can if he gets you into the playoffs. It's similar, like I mentioned, to the Florida Panthers last year. Alex Lyon might not have backstopped them the whole way to the Stanley Cup, but Alex Lyon backstopped him in the playoffs, and he earned the right to start in game one because of that. Now, he was replaced a little bit later by Sergei Bobrovsky, who turned into the Vesna caliber Sergei Bobrovsky. But if you get into the playoffs with Alex Nedeljkovic, which I think that's the way it has to be, because as of right now, it's his net because he's the hot goaltender. He's not going to get that taken away from him unless he starts to, to falter. And when he falters, the Penguins will lose. And if they lose more than two of these games, they're not making it to the playoffs. So the path forward is Alex Nedeljkovic. And if he gets them into the playoffs, if the Penguins make the playoffs, I'm saying it's going to be 
partially because of him being in the net the entire time. So yes, I, I think he starts the playoffs if the Penguins are able to make it. Luke Herbert asks, longer term question, but if you're projecting ahead, how many more seasons do you think Sid will play and how many points will he end with? I got to bring up my projections. I have them in my notes app. They're not currently up in front of me. I have them right here though. Last off season, I looked forward and I said, what does Sidney Crosby need to do in order to finish ahead of Ron Francis and in the top five all time of NHL scoring? And I put out certain point levels for each season. Last year was the first one. He needed 90 in my projections. He has 93. He got 93 last year. This year, he needed 90 again. He's currently at 82. Could I see him getting eight more points in the last eight games? 100%. How are you going to not trust the point per game God getting a point per game when his team season is on the line? So he could hit that 90 again. But to get to 1,800 points, which would put him at fifth all time and two points ahead of Ron Francis, I think he would need to do 60 points next season, 60 points in 2025-26, 50 points in 26-27, and 50 points in 27-28. So if you want me to clean that up, which I will, that means Sidney Crosby would sign a three-year contract extension on July 1st this offseason, which puts him out to four more years after this year. And I think he finishes on or around where Gordie Howe is at fourth all time. Now, if he plays longer, obviously he can move up. He can challenge Mark Messier. He'd have to play for a very long time or keep this consistency up for a longer time to be able to challenge Yarmir Yager for second all time. But I think he finishes... In the top five of all time, I think he finishes around 1,800 points. And I do think that he plays three more years after this one, especially because the guy has over a point per game. If he had decent line mates and a decent power play, he'd be well over 100 points per game. He loves the game, not to mention the fact that he's going to have, hopefully, better line mates and a better team around him next season. So I think he plays those four more years after this year, and I think he finishes around 1,800 points, fifth, fourth, or third all time in the national hockey league history. Pittsburgh Hornets had another question here says also you hinted with the other Nick that the goalies might include flower. What do you think are the odds of that next year? I will say there's a reason I called it chaos theory on that show. There's a reason I called it chaos theory on this show. It's because for the odds of that happening, one, you would need Tristan Jari to be traded. And I think the odds of that happening are slim. Do I think there's a possibility? Yes but I think the possibility is very small. Not only that, you have to think, does Marc-Andre Fleury want to play another year? There's obviously been a lot of rumblings. There's been a lot of body language that this might be the final stand for Marc-Andre Fleury. This might be the final year before his retirement. Does he want to come back? That's another question. And is that 50-50? Where is that right now? Only Marc-Andre Fleury knows. And then you have to wonder, is Joel Blomqvist ready? A lot of people are saying he is. It's one good year. In North America, I think it's great. I'm getting excited about it. I think he's going to look fantastic at the NHL level if I had to project. But again, goaltenders, voodoo. Prospect development, more voodoo. Put those two together, you never know what's going to happen. Let's look for some more questions here. Those were all the ones I got before I started these questions, but you guys have been rocking the comment section. I really appreciate everybody, one, tuning in, and two, making sure that they kept me well-fed with the, the questions here between these last couple of times. Uh, Pittsburgh Heather asks, will the Pens re-sign Ned or has he played himself into a raise and the Pens want to match? The Penguins are going to get the first crack at signing Alex Nedeljkovic. That's the big thing because when you look at his season, obviously he came in in a prove-it year. He came in with an opportunity coming off of two bad seasons in Detroit, hoping that he could really turn his game around and look like the Calder Trophy guy that he was a couple of seasons ago. And then he takes off. He takes off. Do I think he's played himself out of Pittsburgh? That depends on what happens with Tristan Jari, which also depends on what happens in the last week. And I hate to keep going back to that well, but it is the case. Everything's about circumstance. And when you have a guy with four more years left on his contract and you have a guy chomping at the bit in the AHL, do the Penguins want to commit over a million dollars again? 
to a guy in Alex Nedeljkovic, or do they want to trust Joel Blomqvist? Nick Horowat, my co-host on Tip of the Iceberg, had a great point last week. He reiterated it this week. The Penguins had to have a lot of faith and Yoel Blomqvist when they traded away Magnus Helberg and didn't bring somebody in to go above, above Blomqvist again. Because if something happened to one of Ned, one of Jari, and remember back then they were still gunning for the playoffs, they would have had to go to Blomqvist. Now Tristan Jari's sick. I read somewhere in the comment section, I haven't been able to confirm that, that Yoel Blomqvist has been called up. The Penguins haven't said it as of yet, so we'll end up seeing it. But again... I think they would like to re-sign Alex Nedeljkovic, but that depends on the rest of their goaltending situation. Thor throws out here, what's the chances of moving on from Ryan Graves next season? Slim to none. I think that chance is less than the chance that they move on from Tristan Jari as I sit here today. Kyle Dubas, when he went on to Mark Madden last week, reiterated the fact that he thinks that Ryan Graves still has a lot to give the Pittsburgh Penguins as far as his ability to be that defensive defenseman with an asterisk because he is a guy that prefers to have the puck on his stick. But I do think hearing Kyle Dubas's words, a lot of these times, these general managers could lie to you. They can lie to everybody, but I do think it sounded genuine. And honestly, considering the fact that he signed him to that big contract, he probably wants it to work out. So he doesn't look like as much of an idiot for signing him to that big contract. So I think the chances of moving on from Ryan Graves this off season are slim to none. Ori asks, do you think that they'll have the same problems with the Devils tonight that they've been having? Yeah, because the Devils are still just as fast as they were last time. They're just as fast as they've been the last seven times. I think the Penguins are going to have the same issues. The question is going to be, do they adapt? Do they get to the point where they're able to shut down the Devils' speed? Or does whoever's in net stand on their head? That's, that's what it's going to come down to because the Devils aren't going to get any slower and the Penguins aren't going to get any faster tonight unless they put in Sam Poulin for Jeff Carter, then I guess a rising tide lifts all boats. He's a little bit faster than Carter, but again, that's not going to happen. Carter's not coming out of the lineup or is unlikely to come out of the lineup the remainder of the season. So do I think they're going to have the same problems they've had with the Devils? Yeah, I, I think they're going to struggle with the Devils' speed. I think they're going to struggle with the Devils' offense, and I think it's going to become a track meet at certain points in this game, and that does not favor the Pittsburgh Penguins. Heather asks, will the Pens keep Harkins, Achari, and Nieto on LTIR so the kids can keep playing? I'll give you this as simply as possible. As simple as possible. Achari, Nieto are staying on LTIR. I, I'd be surprised, I should say, if they get taken off of LTIR. Nieto, at this point in the season, what are you bringing him back for? You know what he is at the NHL level when healthy. He has a long history at the NHL level. He has one year left on his contract. At what point do you need to rush him back from a knee injury that has certainly had its, its downfalls, had its backfires, and had his unfortunate circumstances where he is taking steps back in his recovery from it. Why would you rush him back? It makes no sense. Achari is on LTIR until after the regular season's over. So unfortunately, he is not going to be back in the lineup or fortunately, depending on what you what you think. I think it's unfortunate that players get injured. Harkins is making progress and I would not be surprised if Harkins got back in the lineup. I don't know what he has over Mike Sullivan, what type of blackmail he does, but not only that, I mean, he's all over Penguin social medias. I mean, Nick, Nick Horwat, my co-host says that too. I don't know what enchantment Jansen Harkins has over the Penguins organization, but I would assume if he's healthy and ready to go, the Penguins will end up turning to him again at some point during the regular season. And then Heather has another question here asking, do the Penguins start next season with both Graves and EK65 on the roster? I don't think they move on from Eric Carlson. I think if you've seen the recent trend of people explaining why Eric Carlson hasn't been as bad as the eye test might appear, or that most people talking might be, believe he has been i think the penguins are obviously going to stick to ek65 and like i said earlier it sounded like kyle dubas was invested in making ryan graves work out in pittsburgh now is that the right move i don't think so i've said on multiple occasions i think that the penguins need to get rid of at least one of them to reshape their their defense but as of right now it's hard for me to see a way in which both of them or either of them i should say ends up getting traded. Let me just do one more cursory search for questions before we go. Uh, that one was earlier. Let's pretend Sullivan and Reardon are gone next season. What candidates are on the table to replace Mike Sullivan? That I'm not at the point right now where I could 
really think about it. Honestly, off the top of my head, the coaching candidates that are available, maybe I can't remember his name, Jay Woodcroft, who was fired by the Edmonton Oilers at one point this season. Maybe he's a candidate to come in. There's also a couple assistant coaches around the NHL that might be in line for a promotion, but at the same time, you know, I'm not exactly sure if the Penguins want to go outside the organization to replace it. And I'm not talking about J.D. Forrest. I know I said that assistant coaches might be on their way out, but if Mike Sullivan decides to leave and Todd Reardon gets fired, there's a chance Mike Vellucci slots into there. Now, whether that's the right move or not, I don't know. But I would think that they view him as a potential candidate if they feel like he's done a good enough job with the penalty kill, which has been one of the best in the league. And if he's done a good enough job with the forwards, which is a different story. So I'm interested to see, you know, who would be available because there's other coaching fires that might come down the pike at the end of the regular season. And obviously you have to take a little bit deeper of a dive as to who's out there and who's available because they could always bring in a no name. Look at what the Washington Capitals did. They brought in Spencer Carberry, somebody they were familiar with, but nobody around the NHL was. And now they're in a playoff spot one year later. So that's what I have to say about that one. And let me see any more. One more, because I very much like talking about Yesapul Yarvi. The Machine TV says, do you think Yesapul Yarvi has been a good addition? Been a pool party fan since he was in Edmonton. I do think he's been a good addition, and I think he's going to be good for the Penguins next season. He's been good in the bottom six, and I think that's a perfect role for him. I don't think he should slot into the top six. I think the Penguins should reconfigure, maybe move out a guy like Riley Smith, bring in somebody else to step into that top six. And honestly, with the way he's been performing, Drew O'Connor might be earning himself a spot in the top six to start next season. But I've liked what Yessa Pugliarvi's brought. He's big, he's physical. He has pretty good skating for a guy that's coming off a double hip surgery. And he certainly loves to get to the front of the net. And I think the Penguins need more of that. You're seeing that with bunting a little bit. You're seeing that with Yessa Pugliarvi. I think they need to continue to make more strides to get more players like Yesapul Yarvi. Now, you need more finishing. That's been Yesapul Yarvi's biggest issue his entire career. He needs to finish a little bit more, but if he can get that under control, and even if he doesn't, the Penguins need young players. They're going to be able to play the style of play that Yesapul Yarvi has been doing his entire career. I've liked watching him on the Penguins, and I'm excited to see what he looks like with a full offseason without having to rehab, without the surgeries, without the unknowing of where he's going to be the next season. He's under contract with the Penguins. He can just work on himself, build up, and hopefully have a career year next year. That's what the Penguins are hoping, and I think it'd be a lot of fun to see him do it, especially with the style of play that he has. It's not Patrick Hornquist. It's not. But you know what? It's in the same vein. Get to the front of the net. Get in front of the goalie's eyes. Get in hard on the forecheck and play physical brain to hockey. I like Yesapul Yarvi a lot, and I'm excited to see what his future holds with the Pittsburgh Penguins. But that's going to do it for this first edition of Tip of the Iceberg Live. Like I mentioned a couple of times in this stream, we are going to be trying to go live every Tuesday around the same time. We'll do the same thing we did here. Weekly recap of what we saw the week previous. Preview of what's going forward. A three stars segment. And then answering all your questions. Obviously, the quest for the playoffs continues for the Penguins over this next week. Only a few weeks remaining in the season. We'll see if they can pull off what I've been de deeming a miracle. But if they do it, hey, I'll sit back, I'll relax, and I'll enjoy it, especially if I get to watch some Pittsburgh Penguins playoff hockey. But that's it for this one. We'll see you guys next time.